This is Tony Broom Ministries welcoming you for the following teaching session from the book of Hebrews, chapters 7 and 8. The title is, A New Priesthood. We have a great high priest today who is set in the heavens as over all. He's a minister of the tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. He's a true high priest. I'm going to talk about him today from Hebrews chapters 7 and 8. And our title is A New Priesthood. This is a different priesthood than the old priesthood. Under the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, they had gifts, offerings, and sacrifices. Under the new priesthood, we have a great high priest, the right hand of the throne of God. This great high priest is one who is always open, always available. In the Old Testament, the high priests were temporary. They were not available all the time. But Jesus is an on time, up time, in time. God, He's always available. We have direct access to the Father through Jesus Christ, our High Priest. And we come directly to the throne of God. A Christian, a man, a woman, a child can come directly to God the Father because of the High Priest. We go through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There are many religions, several of them have priests, and they make their people go through a certain man, a certain priest, to have what they call their sins dealt with or to deal with certain things and religious rites. They have to go through the priest. But that's man-made religion. All of that has been replaced by Jesus Christ. And maybe fulfilled has been a better word than replaced. You don't replace man-made religion, you just do away with it. But I'm glad that we have a great high priest. We have direct access to the Father. Scripture tells us that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So any other priest is man-made. There are only two priests or at least two kinds of priests. One is the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, and the other is our Lord Jesus Christ under the New Covenant. Anything else is outside of what real priesthood is. Of course, we as believers, we're a priesthood of believers in the sense that we're all priests. The Scripture tells us in the book of the Revelation that He has made us kings and priests unto our God. We all rule and reign with Him. That's not seen all yet, but we are part of His kingdom. We're part of the priesthood of believers. But what do we do as a priest? We don't have an office of a priest like they did in the Old Testament. And like some still do, like I say, in their man-made religion, some denominations and religious groups. That's not the kind of priesthood we're involved in. We're involved in the priesthood that offers up spiritual sacrifices to God. That's what 1 Peter tells us about. Well, our golden text says, Hebrews 7, 24, This man, Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Jesus lives forever. He lived, he died, and he rose again, and now he lives forever. Because He lives forever, He has an unchangeable priesthood. I was thinking about unchanging. He has an unchanging priesthood. That is, He doesn't change. He's always the same. But He also has an unchangeable priesthood. That means that not only does He not change, but He cannot change. The priesthood cannot be changed. So who He is and what He is and how He rules and how He commands and how He does things, you cannot change it. He has an unchangeable priesthood. Let's talk about this strange character from the Old Testament called Melchizedek. Melchizedek in Hebrew means 
Literally, it means my king of righteousness, my righteous king. Hebrews chapter 7 tells us about this man that we find in Genesis chapter 14 in the Old Testament. He just appears on the scene. Some people think it's Christ in the Old Testament. Some people think it's another individual. But he is Melchizedek. If he's not Christ, he's certainly like him. There's nobody can really be like him in a way that we can all be like him in that sense. But Melchizedek, he appears out of nowhere, as it were. And he appears on the scene. He comes and meets Abraham. Abraham comes back from the slaughter of the king and he's met by this man with a strange name, Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first by being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So this Melchizedek is king of Salem. That's where you find part of that Jerusalem, king of peace, king of righteousness, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So this Melchizedek meets Abraham, and Abraham gives him a tenth of the spoils that were recovered. So Abraham pays tithes to this Melchizedek. And you find the first time someone paying tithes, and we've paid tithes ever since then. And so he gives him a tenth of the spoils, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Blessed be Abram of El Elyon, of the Most High God. And he blesses him, and he gives him a tenth of the spoils. This Melchizedek, great man, he appears as a priest of the Most High God. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. This priest appears, and he blesses Abraham, and Abraham pays tithes. So, I don't know what this has to do with your situation that you're going through today. But Abraham, who we consider to be a great man, a patriarch, a great man of God, meets someone who is even greater than he because he's the priest of the Most High God. He is blessed by the priest and he pays tithes to the priest. And that's the way it is with the Lord Jesus. Jesus is greater than Abraham. He's greater than Melchizedek. He's greater than all. But God gives us a type of Christ in the Old Testament. We see Him in this man called Melchizedek. He's talked about in Genesis. He's talked about again in the book of Hebrews. And it brings it all together. The priest, that's what he did. He brought things together. He brought man's need before God and he brings God's answer and prophetic order down to man. And it's all brought together. You had to have someone to bring things together because sin had broken the chain, had broken the link. And you had to have somebody to come along and bring things together. In the Old Testament, and we see it first in Melchizedek, in the Old Testament, the priests... They brought things together. They brought mankind in before God again and God to mankind. That was a link. That was a go-between between God and men. And of course now, as I said, we have only one go-between between God and men, one mediator, the Lord Jesus. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. And it's not the Pentecostal way, the Baptist way, the Methodist way. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the Jesus way. And if you really go the Jesus way, you will go in the way of holiness and the way of righteousness. Because God is a God of order and He is a God of love. It doesn't mean everything has to be done canned and formal. That's not what it's talking about. But God always operates in an orderly way. He's not the God of confusion. And so Melchizedek comes on the scene 
He blesses Abraham. And Abraham pays tithes to this Melchizedek. And Christ, Jesus, is like Melchizedek. In verses 14 through 17, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Jesus didn't come through the line of Levi. He didn't come as a Levitical priest. He came through the tribe of Judah, from the tribe of Judah, line of David, Jesus came from this tribe, and this tribe had nothing to do with priesthood. So God brought him, just like Melchizedek, as it were, out of nowhere. And he came on the scene. The people of his day, they rejected him because they couldn't get a hold of who he was. The people of Jesus' day, the religious people, they couldn't connect him. They couldn't connect the dots, so they rejected him. And they thought he was a false prophet. But actually, God brought him through David's line. He was born of a virgin. He was born in to and from a tribe that had nothing to do with priesthood. And he came and sprang. I don't like that. He sprang from the tribe of Judah. Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. It is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. The carnal commandment, that's what it refers to in the Old Covenant. Long as you were doing, you were living. The moment you quit doing, you quit living as far as the law is concerned. This carnal commandment. There was nothing wrong with the law, but there was certainly everything wrong with us. And that was the trouble. It wasn't the trouble, it wasn't the law. But the law was never intended to make man righteous. It was never intended to be our salvation. The law was given to us to bring us to Christ. And because we have come to Christ, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, we're no longer under the law, and we're in the new covenant, and we're not Melchizedek, but we're someone like Melchizedek, and someone better than Melchizedek, we have to do with him, and he has to do with us, and that is Jesus. He's made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. We're talking about an eternal high priest. And when you talk to him, you're not talking to somebody where you go and just stick a little money through the hole in the wall. You're talking to the eternal God. You're talking to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Somebody who can do something about your problems. Somebody who can do something about the situation you find yourself in. For he that is God, he testifies, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In verse 19 says, for the law made nothing perfect. The law was not intended to make anything perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. This blessed hope that Peter talks about, that Paul talks about, this blessed hope brings us before God and we can come near to God. We were kept out by the old covenant. We were kept out because of our sin and our ungodliness. We never could measure up to what the law said. And of course, we as Gentiles didn't have a chance anyway, but even the people who were under the law, those who had the law, they could never measure up to it. Even the apostles said, this is something that, why do we want to put a yoke upon the neck of our new Gentile brother believers? Because we could not keep it. Our fathers could not keep it. Nobody could keep it. Why do we want to put a yoke on the neck of our brothers which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Back to Hebrews. Verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. The Old Testament, that is the Old Covenant, was good. And the New Testament was even better. He was made a surety of a better covenant, a better testament. Because His testament is sealed by His own blood. The Old Testament was made and had to do with the old sacrifices, the blood sacrifice of animals. They could never take away sin. But God... Offering Himself. Pastor Ronnie said the other night, I've never heard it articulated quite like that. 
We know about the sacrifice of Jesus. He gave himself for us on the cross. But what he said was that God, in that sacrifice, God sacrificed himself through his son Jesus. He gave his self to us and for us. And Jesus shed his blood for our sins. And he has made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. The priests in the Old Testament were many. There were lots of them because it was a natural thing. They served for so long and then they died and someone else took over. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. We don't have to have somebody else to come and take his place. Nobody can anyway, but we don't have to have any other priest because he always lives. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart, you ask me. How I know he lives? He lives within my heart. We know that he lives and he has an unchangeable an unchanging priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's able to save you from the guttermost to the uttermost. He's able to save those to the uttermost who come unto God by him because he ever lives to make intercession for them. And that's what priests do. They intercede to God on behalf of the people. And that's what Jesus did for us. He intercedes for us on behalf of us to God and He brings God's answer to us. What a wonderful mediator we have between us and God is the Lord Jesus. For such an high priest became us or is becoming of us or is fitting of us, He identifies with us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. This is our Lord Jesus. He's holy. He's harmless. He's undefiled. He's truly the only one who is actually separate from sinners. And He loves sinners. The Bible refers to Him as a friend of sinners. But He was not contaminated by their sin. He didn't go into their company to fellowship with them in their sin. He ate with them and He drank with them, but He did not partake in their company in the fellowship of sin. But He dwelt among us and became one of us and came and was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And He is holy. He's harmless. He's undefiled. He's separate from sinners. That's the kind of high priest we're talking about. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for His own sins and then for the people's. That's the way they did in the Old Testament. The priests, the high priests in the Old Testament, he had to offer up sacrifice first for his own sin to make sure that he was all right before he went in there before God because if he didn't, he would die immediately. So he had to make sacrifice for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, that is, Jesus did that once when he offered up himself. He's not like the priests in the Old Testament who had to perform sacrifice for his own sin and then for the people's. Jesus had no sin, for he didn't have to sacrifice for his own sin, but he offered himself up for us. This he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. The law had to use men who had imperfections. You couldn't wait till you found a perfect person to serve under the law because there was no perfect person. You had to use what you had. It's the way it is now when you vote people in office, that is in the church or in the outside of the church, you've got to go with what you got. That's not the way it is now. We don't have to go with just any old thing. We have a sure enough high priest. We have a perfect one who stands in the presence of God. The law had to make men priests who were imperfect and had infirmity. But the oath and the word which was since the law has consecrated the Son who is blessed and consecrated forever. Amen. So now Jesus has an everlasting priesthood. Lasts forever. 
chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We've summed it all up in chapter 8, and then he gets so happy he has to go on for 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and more chapters too. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's where our high priest is today. He's set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. He's not behind a curtain over in Rome, over in Jerusalem somewhere. Amen. Not in Russia, not in Iraq. He's not even in Washington, D.C. That's not who you look to. You better look to the God of glory, someone who's up on that throne and there at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. God has a true tabernacle. Some people don't think there's one when you get to heaven, but the book of the Revelation talks about it. It talks about the Ark of the Testament being seen there in the, the temple. There's no need of the temple in the New Jerusalem, but there's the temple that the Lord made and not man. The true temple. And you and I are the temple of God now, of course, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the minister of the sanctuary, the true tabernacle that the Lord pitched and not man. These earthly priests, they offer sacrifices. They offer blood sacrifices and meal and meat and drink sacrifices. And so it was necessary that this man also had something to offer. Jesus had to offer something. He did all right. He offered himself. Jesus is more than just an earthly priest serving in a temporal tabernacle. Moses, God was telling him when he was instructed to make the tabernacle exactly as God had shown him in the mount because it was a shadow of heavenly things to come. God said, see that thou make it according to the pattern which was shown thee in the mount. He had to make it exactly as God showed him because this was pointing to which would come after the Lord Jesus and he fulfilled all that. You can go through all that tabernacle furniture and I don't have the smarts to do it, but there have been people who have done it and do do it. They go through every article and they tell you about all what it means and it all points to Jesus Christ. That's just so much simpler for me to say. It just all points to Jesus. It's all about Him. The table, the candlestick, the showbread, the curtains, the tabernacle, all of it. The Ark of the Covenant. We don't have to go behind that veil anymore. That veil is rent in two from the top to the bottom. Jesus died on the cross. We don't have to go behind the veil anymore. We don't have to be afraid. You touch that ark, you'll die immediately. You don't have to be afraid anymore because the blood of Christ gives us access to the throne of God. Jesus now serves as our high priest in heaven. Chapter 8, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. The new covenant is better than the old because it did things that the old covenant couldn't do. And the promises of the new covenant are better. It's established upon better promises. What are the promises of the old covenant? As long as you're doing, you're okay, you're living. That you quit doing, you quit living. We've already said that. And that's the promise of the old covenant. Promise of the new covenant is a whole lot better. He that cometh to God shall be saved. Whosoever believes on the Lord will be saved. A lot of good promises on the new covenant. If you believe on the Lord, He'll sanctify you. If you believe on the Lord, He'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost. You believe on the Lord for divine healing. There are a lot of good things in the new covenant. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, and you notice it didn't say finding fault with it, Finding fault with them. That is us. We're the ones who contaminated in Israel. They broke the old covenant. Finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, the Old Testament, now in Hebrews chapter 8. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. This is not a covenant on stone. This is a covenant that I will write in their heart. 
I will put this in their mind. You can have a mind that will think like God wants you to think. You can have a mind to worship God. You've heard the old timers say, I have a mind to do this and I have a mind to do that. I got a mind to know you in the nose and all this. Well, we can have a mind to worship God. We can have a mind to live holy. And God gives us that mind. You say, sometimes I've lost my mind. Yes, I have. But thank God I've gained the mind of Christ. And we have a mind to serve God now. He has written these commandments, this new commandment, this new covenant, in our minds and in our hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor, saying, and every man his brother, Know the Lord. You don't have to say, All right, know the Lord. Come on now. It's 10 o'clock. Time to go to church. Come on, Andy. What's the old kids thing? Your grandchildren. Come on, Andy. Time to brush your teeth. Time to play Mickey Mouse. Time to clean your room. Time to do this. And some of these Christians, they sit around waiting for the preacher to tell them everything to do. You don't have to have that. You've got Jesus to tell you what to do. You've got a Bible to tell you what to do. You've got the Holy Spirit. He tells you what to do and what not to do. You won't have to teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. That's what's so wonderful about this new covenant. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. What wonderful thing we have in the new covenant. In that He saith a new covenant, He hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Why would you say vanish away? Why would you do away with it? Well, we don't do away with it. God fulfills it. It's because of our great high priest. It's because of the one that we love and serve. He, because He ever lives, has an unchanging and unchangeable priesthood. He is a great high priest. He is a holy high priest. He is a high priest that you go to Him, you don't have to give Him a dime because He's already paid the whole price for you. He's paid all the price. And what do we do? We give to God. We serve God. We work for the Lord. Not to be saved, but because we are saved, we love the Lord. And it makes us want to do something for God. You've got to do something. Maybe just a little something. Thank God you've got to do something. Because as the pastor I quoted a while ago said again, I've got to have something. I want to have something to present to the Lord. When you get up there in heaven, you step in heaven forever and ever. Don't you want something to present to the Lord? To give to the Lord to praise and glory? Well, if you do, we better be serving God. We better be going about our Father's business and carrying out the Great Commission and doing what Jesus wants us to do. A new priesthood. Thank God we don't have to serve as they did under the Old Covenant. We have a new priesthood. We have a glorious salvation, a way to live. Father, thank You for the opportunity to love Jesus today. Thank You for these two chapters, 7 and 8, from the book of Hebrews. I pray, Lord, that You would use this Word to help us to love You and to serve You more and to help others to do the same. In Jesus' name, Amen. You have been listening to a teaching session from the book of Hebrews, chapters 7 and 8. The title has been, A New Priesthood. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and you know Him as your Lord today. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.